You're listening to the Laura the Library Lady podcast, presented by the Maslin Public Library. Hi, it's Laura the Library Lady coming to you from our basement studio in the Duncan House of the Maslin Public Library. And today I have with me local author Mark Peretta. Welcome, Mark. Thank you, Laura. Uh, as a local author, I wondered if you would tell our audience a little bit about your background and where you're from. Sure. I'm from Canton, Ohio, and went to high school at St. Thomas Aquinas, and eventually would make my way to John Carroll University, majored in communications, English, journalism, and uh, believe it or not, I was originally in television broadcasting. That didn't work that. out. <laughs> it didn't quite work out as I wanted to at the time and ended up getting a, uh, went back to school, got my teaching certificate. And before you knew it, I was hired as a full-time teacher at Canton Central Catholic in 1992. Oh my goodness, 1992. And that was 31 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> and are you still there? No, I was only at Central for three years. I would have loved to have stayed there, um, but financial circumstances dictated that I go to Canton City Schools, and then I found myself in Canton Local Schools, which is where I'm currently teaching at Multi-County Attention Center, and I teach English to the kids that are essentially incarcerated at Multi-County, which is an interesting experience. I'm sure that must be challenging. Wow. <laughs> it is. And no, we do not read my books. <laughs> <laughs> well, they might be a little young for some of your stuff. It's a little more serious with the nonfiction topics that you've got. How did you get started in writing? Uh, I think, again, you know, when I made the commitment to be an English teacher, um, one, I've always loved reading. Um, I have enjoyed writing, uh, you know, when I was in high school, but it was something that I learned to appreciate. And as I read more, I found myself wanting to write more and the two go naturally hand in hand. And I really enjoy now the challenge of trying to construct a well-worded, um, uh, you know, sentence, whether it is, you know, prose or poetry. Um, I really enjoy sometimes, you know, just being struck by the moment of creativity and trying to get my thoughts on paper. I love it. Everyone's so intellectual. <laughs> I just get to read all of your stuff. <laughs> all right. Um, I know there's a special anniversary coming up, and I know you wanted to talk about the USS Indianapolis. Yeah, the Indianapolis, uh, believe it or not, was played a crucial role in World War II. And of course, with the new mo uh, movie Oppenheimer coming out um, about the man who helped develop the atomic bomb, the USS Indianapolis was given the secret mission of delivering the atomic components um, so that they could assemble the bomb and it would be used over Hiroshima. And because it was a secret mission, no one really knew about it. They delivered the components and the USS Indianapolis, to give you a quick background, it basically held a little under 1,200 men. It was the flagship of the U.S. Navy. Technically, it was a light cruiser because its armor was only about three to four inches thick, uh, but it was called a heavy cruiser because of how many guns and how powerful the guns were. Um, typically, heavy cruisers had three times the armor, which oh makes obviously the Indy quite a bit faster because it was lighter, but also more vulnerable to attack. And in fact, if you took all of the Indianapolis's um, eight inch guns and pointed them the same direction and fired at the same time, it would roll the entire ship oh. over that's how powerful they were i remember one story about a sailor who was standing too close his t-shirt was blowing off and he did not get his hearing back for one week oh my goodness uh, but anyways they deliver the atomic bomb essentially on their way home they're torpedoed by a japanese sub and of the 1200 men about 900 make it into the water because it sinks in less than 12 minutes uh, one of the torpedoes essentially broke off the front third of the ship. And as the ship continued for almost, I think it was another two miles because of the speed it was going, it just filled up with water instantly and sank. The men are not going to be rescued for five days. And it was out of pure luck that they were found by um, a pilot. And they were able to pull 317 men from the water one of the men dies, I think, um, after he's hospitalized, so essentially 316. But for five days, they were fighting 
dehydration and shark attacks. And of course, in the movie Jaws, there's a scene that kind of gives a little homage to the men of the Indianapolis when the character played by Robert Shaw, Captain Quint, uh, fictitiously served on the USS Indianapolis. And he refuses to wear a life jacket because oh, the life jackets goodness. were the old K-Pok life jackets filled with bamboo fibers that would absorb the water and essentially didn't do what they were supposed to do after a day or so. Oh my goodness, the things you learn. Oh, that's terrible. Yeah, the other and the other thing with uh, when I was putting together my first book, Heaven Above Earth Below, is it was also to honor the men of the Indianapolis, but also a former student of mine, Jason Mance. Jason Mance went to school at Canton Central Catholic. He served um, as a naval flight officer, flew over 50 missions in the Iraq war and was about six months of getting out, was married, expecting his first child. And um, tragically, in a low altitude training mission, the plane crashed and everyone aboard died. Very sad. So I wanted, always wanted to do something to honor him. So I created a character based after Jason. No, did not hide any names. I called him Jason. <laughs> and um, he has a younger brother named John who finds himself in a little bit of trouble and um, is on a quest kind of to become a man. And he ends up befriending an old man in a nursing home who served aboard the USS Indianapolis. So I kind of directed that one. And basically, it was written from the standpoint of my audience being teens, um, kind of the teenage high school age. But again, it's for adults, too. And I was very blessed. I had very nice reviews on it. But again, that, that wasn't that wasn't why I wrote it. I wrote it because I felt compelled to share the story of Jason and the men of the USS Indianapolis. And I love those kinds of stories where the plot has those two kind of intertwining tales, you know, with the historical fiction aspect, so much of the real story in there, and then modern day story as well. Yeah, and the story is a quick read. It's a novella technically um, because of the number of words and you could probably sit and read it in two, two and a half, three hours at the most. But yeah, it's, it is, it is interesting and kind of fun creating these characters. And then, you know, I've, I've given you this analogy before. It's like taking a deck of cards and uh, basically what you do is, you know, you kind of shuffle them and then rearrange them. Um, but you, at the same point, still try to bring the story together. Uh, so, but it was a fun process. I really enjoyed it and it kind of led me to writing a novel which we're going to talk about next. But first, I do want to mention that, Mark, you're going to be here at the Maslin Public Library in July 2023 to do a presentation for the public on mm -hmm. the Indianapolis and kind of your yeah, writing process. Exactly. Basically, uh, it's going to be the 78th anniversary of the sinking of the USS Indianapolis. Mm -hmm. And tragically, you know, you know, you look back at many of the, the survivors and the survivors just because... They lived, went on to have families, and their kids had kids. And you see this whole web of, of people that otherwise wouldn't exist if they would have never been rescued. And uh, all the men on board the USS Indianapolis, all the survivors who made it, uh, unfortunately have died. They have passed away. I was lucky enough to go to a couple of the reunions when there were, uh, this was back in 2016, 17, 18, before COVID hit. Uh, and actually meet some of them. And I'm going to, at my author talk, not only show some video of the actual survivors talking to me, show you some pictures of the actual survivors. And again, the thing that you really take away, that I took away, if you ask them about the heroes, they weren't the heroes that survived. The heroes, they said, were the ones who didn't make it. But yes, at the end of July, I will take everyone, if they're interested in a little trip, in terms of history and how I put the books together and my thought process and even how I design the covers because you know you try to do everything with a purpose and one of the things that I always try and do is it wasn't just writing the book it was I designed the covers for the books I designed websites and you know essentially tried to get an idea of what it was like to even do audiobooks I did an audiobook for the first so very try to pay attention to the details. Wow, you are very creative. And that is really neat that you can incorporate all of those different media and different parts of that to go with your book and go with your stories. So I'm going to be looking forward to that. Um, that kind of where you're kind of talking about taking a card or a block of writing and kind of shuffling it around. 
that sounds like kind of a fun thing to do. Did you ever do that with your students? You know, maybe you have an idea for creative writing where they kind of wrote something on a card. I, and I'm old school paper, you know, based. I'm not going to write it on a computer. Mm-hmm. Write something on a card, write something on another card, shuffle them up and, and do yeah, the Yeah, you know, I've, I've done different activities. I even did these with my kids at home. Uh, <laughs> where basically what we'll do is each of us will start a story. And we'll start with the same sentence, like something like, I don't know, space aliens landed in the backyard and all the lights in the house went out, something like that. And then everyone has to write the next sentence that happens. So you have five different people writing a different sentence for the same (laughs) first sentence. Then everyone takes that paper and passes it to the right. So you then you have to read what the story is that's being created by the previous person and then add to that story. And then you keep passing it around uh, until, you know, you decide that's enough or you get a a page or a couple of pages and the stories are usually hilarious. Uh, (laughs) But, but yeah, each think of each character as almost their own deck. So each character has their own story. But what the thing that's I think really enjoyable is when you shuffle the different stories together Uh, It starts out, again, think of a circle where I start at the beginning of the circle with the, you know, X character X, Y, Z. And in the process, I tell their stories, but I also try and bring them together. And I try and by the end of the book, bring everything back to the beginning of that circle. You bring it full circle. I mean, it's a good, it's just a good um, idea. Even, you know, if you have to write a speech, if you, you know, if you ever have to do something, write something good writing just brings everything back kind of to how you started. Just read an article in like sports illustrated. I used to use this example and show them this all the time in class. How many times the first, you know, the attention getter right in the first sentence Mm -hmm. or three is always brought back at the very end. It's, it's just good writing. Tie it up. Yep. Tie all the threads together. That sounds great. Fun. Um, well, I know that you've obviously modeled a character after a real person, Jason Mance, but have you modeled any characters after yourself? Never after myself, but um, in my most recent book, Song of Seagull, and Seagull, if you don't know, is French for cicada. Yes, the little flying insect, Seagull. It's basically a cicada. I used as a homage to my grandparents all their names. Um, oh, that's yeah, really neat. And actually, um, the German officer that I bring in, because the story revolves around five people, two American brothers who are paratroopers, a brother, sister who the mom and dad fight for the French resistance in France, and then a German um, officer whose dad fought in World War One. And I made some, like I said, homages to my grandparents, great grandparents, and even my parents. Um, in terms of using their names in the book. So that's that really kind of cool. Yeah, that is really cool. nice to, you know, kind of have that personal history there. And especially when you're writing historical fiction, I think that's, um, you're, you know, you're using real stories, real facts from the past, and then to tie that in with your actual yeah, the, the American, not in addition to that, too, there were some friends and American soldiers. A lot of the American soldiers I have were my buddies from high school. Uh, and really they got cute. a big kick out of oh. seeing their names in the story. Neat. OK, so nobody was mad. No, 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 no <laughs> one was mad. No one was mad. Uh-uh. Good. OK, well, um, I wanted to know if you would read a short excerpt for us. Sure. The excerpt that I have chosen is one of the main characters Uh, Murph, I just spoke about the French brother and sister, the girl, her name is Carol. Her brother has left, um, right before world war two came to the French to go train and come back and hopefully defend his country. She is also in addition to technically having lost her brother because he's not there. Her parents were murdered by the Germans for being French resistance at the end of chapter one. And she goes to her uncle, her dad's brother and, um, one of the things she did when she was young is she searched the countryside with her brother for fun, looking for cicadas. And that is how I kind of came up with the title song of Seagull is she and her brother would do this. And now kind of after things have settled down and the through German occupation, she decides to go back into the countryside and, um, and look for the cicadas almost to get a sense of normalcy with what's going on. And again, you have to remember 
you know, war makes people grow up. We had kids 17, 18 years old going to fight for us. Uh, you know, mothers signing for young boys to go fight, um, in here, you know, again, she's just a kid, but she does something that she can hopefully get a sense of normalcy. So she goes into the countryside looking for cicadas and here we go. There were no cigals in the hills today. She said her voice low. My box is empty. The cicadas will return child like many things when this war ends. Will they? She asked. And what of life then? Jean sighed. War makes us doubt everything. I'm beginning to doubt life itself. Carol, uncle gazed at her parental affection gleaming in his eyes. Though we don't, though we doubt, there are some things we should never question. His weight shifted in the chair. Never doubt your family's love. Never doubt your French heritage. Never doubt the importance of your parents' efforts. But right now, at this moment, never doubt the flame of French resistance. It must not die. She nodded, and something deep inside of her sparked to life. She welcomed it. We have all felt Nazi brutality, columns of German soldiers, hordes of displaced French citizens, and what has been done to anyone of Jewish descent is beyond comprehension. If we have learned anything from this terrible war, it is that we cannot be silent. I know, she whispered. I just miss them. I miss them terribly. As do I. How do you do it, she asked. How do you go on despite the death and darkness? I go on as you will, one day at a time. The lines of determination in his face tightened. You, my dear, are stronger than you ever believed, and you must see it. To that, she had no response. You were impetuous in your youth, sneaking my cookies as a child, he teased. A twinge of a smile tugged at her lips. And while war seems to break all of us, the very good and very righteous, he focused on the ovens and became still. It can also make us stronger, especially in the places we think are broken. Carol exhaled. I will try, she said at last. I will finish the work Papa and Maman started. I know their ways. And you, my dear niece, are a wonder. She wiped her cheek with a frayed sleeve, a habit from so much crying. She looked at her uncle as the words spilled from her mouth. I I have no more tears. Cupping her chin, he raised it and studied her eyes. No more tears, but plenty of French resolve. A bone-deep fatigue gnawed at her soul, but something surged in the same chest that suffered moments ago as if a great weight lay upon it. You have postcards? Pyramidin? he asked. Oui. Everything I need to write in our special ink. Then we continue our efforts. Our scouts will contact us soon. As he pushed the chair away with the back of his legs and stood, a slight groan escaped his lips. My back is not what it once was, he said. But come, we must get home. Your tante is most certainly wondering why cleaning a floor has taken so long. With a quick breath, he leaned forward and blew out the candle. She followed him to the next room and out of the bakery. As she stood on the cobblestone street waiting for him to lock the door, she shivered in the cold night air. Clutching the collar of her drab brown shirt, she pulled it tight around her neck. He turned and faced her. Ready? Carol nodded. Merci, uncle, for everything. Remember, my dear, war is winter, but the promise of spring never fails. Uncle Gene repeated his last words, singing gleefully, the promise of spring never fails, and we must never be silent. His cheeks were blotchy red as a chuckle escaped his lips. Now come, Aunt Margaret has prepared dinner. Spend the night. Reaching for her hand, he pulled her near. Rest, gather your strength. For tomorrow is a new day. She glanced over her shoulder at the bakery entrance. Wait, I forgot my box. Leave it, he said. Tomorrow we fill it with bread. (laughs) A little bit of symbolism at the end again. You know, that the new day, new hope, take one day at a time. And what these people went through in World War II is just absolutely unbelievable. And, um... You know, it will be filled with bread and the cicadas will come back and war will end and we just have to make it to that point. That was an awesome reading. I think there are so many things that we can learn from historical fiction. You know, if if you don't care for reading nonfiction or facts or anything, 
there's so much out there and so many books about World War II currently. Um, you know, if you haven't heard of the French Resistance, it's really inspiring that all of those French people did that and, you know, tried to resist the Nazis. Um, you know, just all kinds of different things that you can learn. I just read something about um, prisoners of war in the Philippines, Americans, um, people from England who went to France to help drive ambulances and things like that and were stuck there. So there's just so much to learn out there. And I think, you know, with a good historical fiction novel, you can learn a lot without thinking you're studying. Yeah. It's a very popular genre today. Um, you know, there's a great series on PBS called Memoirs of War. And there's some local people who have just unbelievable stories. And um, yeah, the, there's a ton of them. And, and they, they're very, very compelling. And the cool thing about, uh, you know, historical fiction is yeah well it's fiction but there's a lot of history in it right. and you can learn a lot just like you were saying and whether it's a non-fiction book like unbroken by laura hildenbrand which That's is a, a must read book, yeah. um i currently read um out of the depths uh which is the story of the uss indianapolis which is also a must read to get an idea of what these these men went through but um, whether it's women, um, if you think of uh, Kristen Hanna, The Nightingale mm -hmm. is an amazing story um, about, you know, again, what all people do in times of war. And it just concerns me that the farther we get away from, you know, that generation and that time, people are so worried about things and airing their problems on Facebook. And it's like, come on, people, you know. Yeah. Some of you just need to build a bridge and get over it. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. There's some something a little bit more serious and, and more important to be thinking about, yeah. you know. Uh, right. Because, I mean, my grandparents were that World War II era. And, of course, they're all gone. And many of most of the World War II veterans are gone. As you said, all the guys from the Indianapolis, they're all passed away now. So. Right. And, you know, just remember, there were two. We, the U.S. fought two wars, basically, the in the European theater and the Pacific theater. And the stories from each are div, com, just very, it's very diverse, different circumstance and different environments, but just amazing stories of how people can persevere and that the ordinary person can do things they never thought imaginable and become, you know, not that they're trying to be, but do things that are heroic. Mm hmm. Yeah. And, you know, we can be inspired by that. And even if it's talking about people at home, like some of the characters in your book, they're, you know, they're at their bakery, but they're going to do something for the war effort, too. Right. And, you know, maybe her aunt isn't going to be involved in the resistance. I don't know. I haven't read it yet. <laughs> but, um, you know, she's kind of holding down the fort and, and helping them, supporting them as they're doing their thing. And I'll know when you've read it because I'll be looking for the review on Amazon, Lauren. Ah, uh, Okay. All right. You can hold me to that. Well, I want to thank you so much for coming in to talk with us today. Um, I want to know if you can tell everybody how they can get a hold of your books sure. if they're interested. Yeah. You know, it's as easy as going to Amazon. And if you do a search uh, by author Mark Peretta, and that's kind of like Beretta, but with a P-P-E-R-R-E-T-T-A, -E -E um, or you can search Heaven Above, Earth Below or Song of Seagull, and Seagull is spelled C-I-G-A-L-E. Or you can go to my website, which is markfperetta.com. Awesome. You can also check out the library because I think we have your books yeah. because I think you donated them to us. <laughs> yes, I did. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to thank you so much. Um, look forward to you being here to do your presentation and also for some future local author fairs that we have mm -hmm. twice a year. So hope to see you there. Thank you so much for being here. You're welcome. Yeah, if you love history, we'll see you in, at the end of July, 78th anniversary of the U.S. S. Indianapolis. It'll be good. It'll Thank be inspiring. You. Hey, everyone. This is Jeff, and I hope you enjoyed listening to the Lore of the Library Lady podcast. Join us for the local author book fair on Saturday, November 11th, 2023, from 11 a.m. to 2 p.m. This event is open to all and is held twice a year in both March and November. Browse, purchase books, meet, and network with local authors. Visit MasslinLibrary.org for more information. Hope to see you there.